Hello, everybody. I'm Thomas Lax, Associate Curator in the Department of Media and Performance Art here at the Museum of Modern Art. Thank you so much for being here tonight for Kathleen C. Stewart's Method Acting. It's a pleasure to have those of you who were here last night as well as today back with us. And it's been a, a true pleasure working with our collaborators, Adrian Heathfield and Andre Lepecki, um, who have organized Afterlives, the, the conference that continues through tomorrow. We hope to see some of you again tomorrow afternoon uh, for the last session at FIAF. For those of you who'd like to attend, you can either buy tickets online or you can go directly to FIAF and buy tickets in person. Uh, the conversation titled Active Objects, Vital Matter, and the Lives of Things will happen at 2.30. Um, it's also been a pleasure working with the Alliance Francaise and in particular the Crossing the Line Festival, Lili Chopra um, and Simon Dove, and of course our colleagues at Columbia School of the Arts, Carol Becker. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to invite Adrian here to introduce Kathleen Stewart. And so here we are again in the preamble. <laughs> Um, seems like there are, we, we did actually intend to do so many preambles and we staged Matthew's discourse on the preamble as well. So, um, so for those of us uh, engaged in the interfaces of performance studies, theatre studies and philosophy over the last few decades, and for those committed to practical thinking and making around the effects, affects and efficacy of performance and live art, experimental theatre and conceptual dance. There's been a recurrent focus on questions of temporality, on the instance and the moment, a turning over of the nature of eventhood. Often uh, this has been framed as isolate and bracketed and thought of as breach, as fissure, as rupture or interruption in various orders of knowledge and power. Much less attention, um, much less time and attention has been given to the prolonged, the processual, the continuous, the resilient, the obdurate, the slow morphologies, the lingering and insistent dimensions of performance practices. That is to say, those dimensions, energetics, and forces of performance that remain, that move through time and register in history, often as subterranean rivers or as imperceptible flows. One might say those aspects and qualities of performance that exist in close proximity to the conditions of life. In part, our quest here in Afterlives is to try to rethink the persistence of performance, to think about forms of artistic practice under the terms of the durable, the sustained, the surviving, or simply to attune to the micro events of the lived durations of artworks. Then we could uh, if part of that, that quest uh, are those things, then we could no, do no better than to turn actually outside of the immediate field and to listen transversally to Katie's writing. Katie's singular work in anthropology and ethnography runs in rich veins of experimental, philosophical, itinerant, co-implicated writing in the field from figures such as Alfonso Lingus and McTausick but one could equally trace some ancestry and present affinities in écriture feminine, in the feminist fictions and memoirs of figures like Clarice Lispector, Kathy Acker, or Maggie Nelson, and of course with performative writing itself, affect theory, and ficto criticism. Purposefully turning critical thought away from its often recited and deadened terminology from its totalizing, rationalizing, and de determining tendencies. Katie's writing enters into the thick middles and paradoxical tones and feelings of her lived realities. It goes in search of what my colleague Eric Rogoff calls, after Raymond Williams, infrastructures of feeling, those elusive and emergent formations of felt thought on the way to becoming socially sedimented perceptions commonalities, and thus profoundly structuring experience and social life. For Katie, as you will hear, this quest requires a certain sensory reattunement, a kind of environmental consciousness where humans are not the only agents, nor necessarily the dominant ones, 
where objects, animals, powers, elements, weathers, thoughts, fears, daydreams start to speak to each other and are interanimated in the making of worlds. This sensibility in writing is one that will be familiar for many of you working in the long traditions of performance art and performance writing, where an egalitarian ecology and an attunement to the sensed and enfleshed materiality of things is a relational principle from which to move and to make. The object, if such a word is still pertinent at all, is not to subject life to what we know, but to discover forms of expression adequate to approach it and to liberate its potentials. And so it's a really uh, the third, fourth, fifth joy of today uh, to welcome Katie Stewart. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you all for coming. So I'm going to um, accumulate stories uh, tonight in today's talk that are a way of trying to create a kind of generative space, as Fred said in his beautiful and terrible voicing of something last night. And it's also akin to what Lynn and Matthew were calling the world's fugitive presences and their articul articulation of the wandering and maybe um, a place where what I'm doing gets a specific is that it's uh, talking about something that's profound but also absolutely ordinary. So when Adrian invited me to participate in this event, the concept method acting popped into my head like the time years ago when a woman who was thinking of buying the house across the street knocked on my door and asked me whether people in, in the neighborhood used chemicals on their lawns or dryer sheets. At first, I had to think, what, what's a dryer sheet? <laughs> but then images popped up, the sweet smell of dryer sheets coming in with the breeze on a cloudless day, the little orange flags stipping, sticking up out of the grass at the schoolyard, warning that chemicals had been sprayed, the chemlon trucks parked in front of the houses with big lawns. I mumbled something about all this, and she was gone, leaving in her wake little seeds of anxiety. Tasking myself to talk about method acting in an extended sense was not exactly a decision, though. And it, and the, it came out of me, and it was not intentional, even though I was activated. It was like a phrase surfacing from a magic eight ball, or rather from years of conversations with Lauren Berlant, whose use of the term puts pressure on the status of the concept itself, fashioning it into a scene both sharply precise and diffuse a magnetizing of cluster of overdetermined possibilities for form and performance. This conceptual surfacing also happens in writing workshops I run where everyone reads 500 word piece and we talk about them three or four at a time, scanning their surfaces and rhythms for what might be nascent in their descriptive points of precision. For me, method acting is an example and performance of an initiation of associative logics through sharp lines that approach objects and by turning them into in actors into fields of influence and concern. I'm using also a formal experiment of 100 word pieces that Lauren and I are developing in a book called The Hundreds. This writerly pressure intensifies the compositional quality of the writing, producing density, hyperactive lists of possibilities and angles, or a slow haiku that stills. But it also pushes the concept into a scene so that it acts like a room of scraps and snatches that might be prolonged or sounded out in the doubling and tripling of some generativity. So method acting. We pivot like method actors on the nub of a detail, the pain in a hip, your hair akimbo. For Al Pacino, method acting is like getting into a state that brings about freedom and expression and the unconscious. A point of precision becomes a way in. Then muscles of voice and posture have to be built from inside out. Lefebvre says to capture a rhythm, one needs, one needs to have been captured by it. 
At some point, Pacino becomes the character, maybe only at the last minute when the camera finally prompts it. It could be that there was a moment when method acting became widespread. Thomas de Zengotita says that the Kennedy assassination pushed the US into a wholesale performance it never came out of. Others think of modernism, the industrialization of experience, or cognitive capitalism, a quickening of sensory impulses, or there's the 50s or the 30s, or in academia, the time social constructionists became so attuned to the locked together mediation of everything that they spun circles, making, making a mantra, like wearing grooves into matter. One of the things that gets me is friends who forget the clothes or books they borrowed are not actually theirs. There's no getting to the bottom of this kind of thing, though you might have a passing fantasy of documenting what actually happened. But whatever you do, you become a method actor in the script they started. But really, even if you start on your, out on your own, there's always a speculative recovery to be done of some pulse, some gait, or tempo re revenant in things. The 1950s. Mundane forms of care and renunciation formed a scaffolding for living people couldn't quite claim as their own. They said it was just what people did. Tips circulated, gadgets came and went, scenes of pleasure floated by, habits took hold as judgments held in common with others. Spaghetti day, laundry day, vacuuming day, a week of spring cleaning, a phone call during dinner always got the same response. I'm sorry, we're having dinner. Could I have her call you back? Every night they listened to the nightly news. The world had become something to see. A life had become something to have. There were family vacations at the beach or a lake, the rowboats, the women on chaise lounges, the intimacy of those bathing suits, a middle classness spreading across population expanses. Winter clothes went into cedar chests for storage, plaques mounted on walls offered aggressively mundane inspirations. It's not the mountains ahead that wear you down, it's the grain of sand in your shoe. On my mother's dresser, just above her jewelry drawer, was a milky statue of the Virgin Mary that glowed with a bluish hue when the lights were turned off. Pop's freezer. By the time Helen died after 61 years of marriage, Pop's house had become an infrastructure of an upright life. The same can opener mounted on the kitchen wall for 40 years, the same bottle opener on its stand in the pantry, a proliferation of tools to core tomatoes or strawberries, a pan for poaching eggs, some bowls with silver rims that had to be washed by hand every, after every use, tiny bowls for the potato chips that occasionally replaced the oyster crackers with the soup at lunch. He kept an inventory, revised monthly, of the food stocked in his freezer in the basement. Barbecue sauce, one. Barbecue, four. Marinara sauce, one. Chili beans, one. Chicken broth with chicken, five quarts. Chicken broth pints, eight. Yellow squash, two. Green peppers, one. Mixed greens, 17. Vegetable soup, two. Chicken and vegetable soup, 14. Turnips, four. Chicken and pasta soup, nine. Deer sausage, one. Deer steak, two. Chicken legs long, 10. Chicken legs short, eight. Deer steaks ground, one. Pork ribs, one. Sterloin, sirloin steaks, one. Sweet potatoes, 22. Biscuits, 30. Rolls, one box. Chicken and broth, five. Sugar cake, one. Turkey and broth, three. Spaghetti sauce, 27. Worlding, one. Howie Becker says a world is real people trying to get things done mostly by getting other people to do things. Looking for applause, we put on the best show we can in a collective activity that perhaps no one wanted, but is the best everyone can get out of the situation and therefore what they all in effect agreed to. Isabella Stengers might call this a vivid pragmatics a co-presence with a milieu that not only attunes you to what's going on, but moves you to initiate, imitate, and elaborate skilled lines of action. Jazz musicians are supposed to smoke dope. Graduate students learn how to please their professors. 
lopping limbs. I fall into step on the sidewalk behind a family of five. Two kids with their parents and an extremely thin and blonde grandmother who has the gnawed face of a meth addict or otherwise very sick person. She lopes when she walks, pulling her long limbs from behind. She places each footstep way out in front of, of her. Her head stays out front too, leading the effort and swinging from side to side like a dinosaur, her eyes cutting back over her shoulders. Her arms move out and around in circles a little randomly. Her shoulders are rigid and straight across the back like a hardcore alcoholic's. It's as if she's been torn limb from limb and now son suddenly finds herself on a trip to the outlet mall with her daughter's family. Her shorts are ironed. <clears throat> she has nice sandals. She's a pterodactyl, a body double. What's happening to her body reminds me of someone's mother I've met a few times at a gathering at the beach. She has the lopping limbs, too. She's so anxious she can't really talk or venture out, but she wants to, and she once did. She only eats a few vegetables now. People make sure I get wind of this, so I stand next to her at Thanksgiving dinner. We start off pretty well, talking about books and travel, how we know people in the room, but after 20 minutes, we're in a trap, and I have to be the one who awkwardly and very deliberately drifts away, releasing us from the moment. But now we're pulled into a ricocheting ping of some backlog of social failures. The next three days are tweaked by the occasional furtive look or a sharp turn of the heel on the poolside pavement to avoid contact. We have no bad feelings for each other, but bad feelings are literally between us, gluing our sympathies to an attending gap that hypes up our hypervigilance disorders. Life is a rough terrain. You take a walk. Something throws together around you. Something weighted but incipient. Pre precise but strewn across a field of rhythms and bodies of all kinds. Literal bodies, bodies of thought or discourse. A walker with a routine gets used to the little apparitions of something throwing together in his or her vicinity. He might arm himself with giant headphones and a stick or she might stay alert to the need for a quick response to the comments from passers-by. With each encounter, there are always questions of rules of contact, like what to do with your eyes. Two men talking on the street. Ron is walking Copper, the ancient dachshund runt, on a busy Austin street. A man in a truck waiting for a light to change calls out in an Irish brogue. What a beautiful dog. And then, perhaps noticing that the whiteness of her face is age, not a miracle, that her toothless mouth caves into the blackness of death, that her eyes are blind black with cataracts, a creature not what, what she once was, he revs up his proclamation. She is the most beautiful creature I've ever seen. Ron is a little taken aback, but he's on it. Thank you very much. She's a doll. He would have gone on, stepping up to the opening, but the light changed. I imagine the two men gazing at each other for a few seconds as their paths pull apart, interrupting something set in motion. Another Ron story. He mostly talks to animals. I'm buttoning up my shirt, and all of a sudden I smell this smell, and there's this soft poop at my feet. And Copper's standing there looking up at me like, he shrugs his shoulders and he stares with a deadpan. Hooray for me and fuck you. Ron walks away with a little jauntiness, putting a point on it as he goes. I am the slightly giggling co-witness and not the judge. What was that? I'm walking Kuka past the schoolyard. A young boxer runs up to a man whose dog is on a leash. The man yells, hey, get your dog. The boxer's owner is cavalier slowly starting to amble across from the other side of the field. He calls out way too casually, as if it's not necessary to say anything at all. He's friendly. The worked up guy includes me in his retort. We don't know that. Get your fucking dog. 
This ain't even a leash-free park, so don't give me that shit. His body is now bouncing up and down, but moving fast forward, too, like a beach ball blown by the wind. I'm a little worked up, too, fashioning possible reactions in my head. Yeah, that's right. Or, hey, leave me out of this. Strange how the quick surge to rage becomes interchangeable with a cutting edge of the bearable. A dog loosed by an oh-so-casual owner sets another man aflame, but also he sounds like he's from New England. That explains something. <laughs> On the ground, ethnography claims to be writing from a ground, but what kind of ground is it that sends people bouncing takes place as a threshold and hits the senses as a set of provocations? What grounds a disturbance in a field or the swell of a material aesthetic topography of peaks and valleys? On what grounds do dogs master the art of deadpan and accents set off a line of associations? Matter poems. In the constant variation of matter and form, experience and things co-compose in sensations, textures, tones, and movements. At the end of a day of cross-country skiing, in the push to find the way out of the woods, the light turns a cold navy blue. The car you've been driving for 10 years certain, suddenly turns into a dead ride. The scruffy middle-aged men at the Walmart with their elderly mothers who are buying them food and clothing become recognizable as some kind of thing in the repetition of the scene. Wallace Stevens famously describes this perception of fleeting form as the flickering in the area between is and was, a coming on and a coming forth that can be physical if the eye is quick enough. On a day still full of summer, when the leaves appear to sleep within a sleeping air, they suddenly fall and the leafless sound of the wind is no longer a sound of summer. So profound a change is constant. That's Stevens. Worlding two, a quality of light and a bit of wind lock together. The too muchness of things hones down to something for us if we learn how to stand or take up a beat. Michelle Saris puts it this way, one writes initially through a groundswell that comes from the background noise or from the whole body maybe, or maybe from the depths of the world or through the front door, carrying its complicated rhythm or its simple beat. One cannot grip one's pen, but this thing, which does not yet have a word, takes off." Unquote. Jack. Jack is the heroin addict in Roxana Robinson's novel, Cost. His neighborhood was, quote, charged with electric urgency. In the morning, heading out to cop, the streets were full of risk, tension. Everything was an obstacle to be overcome or negotiated. It was like struggling through high grass. On the way home from his dealer, he walked fast, full of accomplishment and anticipation. After using, the landscape was an, had a knowing fullness. It became benign, full of languorous plenitude. Then there was nothing he needed to get past, get through. He was part of everything with bliss. He could not imagine living anywhere but where he lived or doing what he was doing. How worlds arrive in selves. A chaos, a scene of absorption, or a dead zone becomes an ambient real, riven by living itself. Pockets of living through whatever's happening become so radically situated that thought feeling ventures into an incipiency. A pressing crowd of possibilities unfolding throws together into a tendency, Munoz's mode of the possible. There is an ontogenesis of sense in some moment of flatness or in a tentative readying. Henry. All of Kittredge's husband, Henry, quote, still wakes early and remembers how mornings used to be his favorite, as though the world were his secret, tires rumbling softly beneath him and the light emerging through the early fog, the brief sight of the bay off to his right, and then the pines, tall and slender, and almost always he rode with the window partly open, 
because he loved the smell of the heavy salt air, and in the winter he loved the smell of the cold. And any unpleasantness that may have occurred back in his home, any uneasiness at the way his wife often left their bed to wander through their home in the night's dark hours, all this receded like a shoreline. Being in something, a display table of elements flashes erratically like a light bulb going out, a taste for pecan sandies, an arcane card game, the habit of leaving your windows open in the winter. You try to keep your wits about you. You learn to catch a passing quip or to turn your head away. There are opportunities for sincerity or snarkiness. There are receptivity mistakes, maybe the poise of a balancing act. At best, the fluidity of a perfect timing. The men at the Eloquoia store. I heard they were so right wing it would make your head spin. I expected them to be puffed up when I walked in, but they were wide open and mid-grin. Mid they had timing. We were from Texas. Texas, what a shithole. Those people are nuts. If they can't see 100 miles in every direction, they're miserable. This guy came here, he hated the trees. He said he couldn't see anything. Trees were always in the way. We knew we were in the zone of stereotypes and first impressions, but that was the thing. Amarillo. That place is like the surface of the moon. If there was oxygen on the moon, they'd all move there. <laughs> we fabricated ourselves as little judges. These guys had moved to New Hampshire from Slummerville or Lynn Lynn, the city of sin. First, it was just weekends to visit the retired dad, then Thursday to Tuesday, and then all the time because they just liked it better. Then comes the butt. It's a Gestapo state. Don't drink and drive in this state. They'll take your license. And there it was. It took three minutes. They were calling out an obligation to a milieu I couldn't get into, but I could feel the force and fear of something going on with the police. Labors of being. You walk your dog, you send your kid to a new school, now you're a regular somewhere, or you're homeless, or transgendered, or from some place. How'd you get into that? What is that? The mode is surprise, not because worldings take place in secret or through exclusions, but because they are an unexpected activation of the details of something now somehow at hand. A commitment to what you didn't know was there, but now sense. Maybe something etches into you, like tree sap baked into a windshield over a triple-digit month in Texas. You wouldn't think of putting your old furniture out on the street, or that's exactly what you do. Then you watch to see what happens to it. Someone will stop to look at it. They will wait to see if there will be objections, maybe some information or a missing screw, maybe some sign of goodwill or irritation. Apathic entrainment presses all the problematics of orientation into service. Being in it or staying out of it, why this and not that, why her and not him, why me, why should I, what's in it? You find yourself suspended in an undertow of reluctance or lodged in a partially compelling but never completely unfolded presence. Maybe a kind of eye contact or a tendency to warm up to strangers that only goes so far. An enigma that is also an overfilling of form renders its we a voice of contagious reiteration. What was that? Did you see that? The mouth and the throat become tunnels of vibration and shape. Words rush to judgment or they languish or skitter. Maybe some sinkhole promises a confirmation or a temporary pit stop or some ideological stranglehold incites its own hyperattunement to some irritants coming at its ideal plane of the same. Or maybe there's a blissful pause. Townies. As a townie, I shared a physical aversion to having the heat on at night. Our noses would swell and fill with blood. That we had a loyalty to the expressivity of things. The town accents calling out, the sociality pauses on the way to the library or in the, or in the aisle of the supermarket. We knew when a few pansies stuck in a window box was a failed gesture at spring and when it succeeded. 
that a front porch slightly cluttered or too bare was not just the sign of a shut-in inside, an unemployed, a depressive, an addict, a meanness, but the actual matter of a slackening, as if the plastic siding long ago layered over the wood was itself necrotic. It was as if everything was an event already scored onto matter, but only sort of. We noticed the trees. We felt the bony truth in the mantra that the beach is cold and gray in the winter and windy in a bad way. The woods around the lake where people walked their dogs were also the scene of estranging teenage first times. When someone died, we went to the wake, not because community was something stamped on us, but to witness en masse the weight of the world. Bars had the hyperplane intimacy of a 1970s basement rec room. A townie was someone who could feel the pull of all the possibilities blowing through a scene. Maybe little gold stars floating over our heads or an opportunity to act out. The game of recognition was a joke launched from a not quite affectation. Eye contact pinged around the Dunkin' Donuts line. Situations marshaled singularities into a competence, an ekphrastic phrasing peppered with swear words, the jaw slackening into crazed accents around certain words. But nothing ever happened without first registering a commitment to exhausting webs of complication, resource issues, and dark little tunnels of limited choice. We were agoraphobes drawn to an edge the town line's patch of gray concrete held the promise of sentience itself. We felt it in our guts when we crossed over it. Race, class, and ethnicity hovered above it in the mode of the really real, as if the world literally burst into color on the home side and went gray in the instant of passing over the edge. And yet the town line had to be breached. It was a faltering into a venturing out, like it or not. We crossed it alone and mapless, almost deliberately unprepared, in a kind of free fall, eyes straight ahead as if we had no necks. Things happened when you set out to get pita bread from the Lebanese place one town over and only one mile away. We winged it. Everything we did was a turning point that ended up in a quagmire. Disorientation held a promise in a world of not quite things not quite intentionality, not exactly agency, but an energetics of form, a twisted sociality performed. No one knew the names of streets. It was as if there was no circuit between the street signs our eyes must have seen and what we considered our business to know. It was as if the point was to spend ourselves and we were up for it and no nonsense. We ran the gamut of down-to-earth voicings as if running a gauntlet. It is what it is. That's enough of that. No more beer for you, no more talking to her. You put an end to cooking on the patio or music with dinner. Memories. Memories cross your path like the bugs you once dreamed of collecting in a jar until mom said, let them go, don't be cruel. But they're the cruel ones, showing up in the middle of a drift or cutting into the edges of the droning forward motion, always already skirted by danger and a dull light. Memories are more debris than remainder or summary, not something to recover, but a trace that can't quite be erased. Peg remembers that our mother made us get short haircuts when we were kids because it was easier to take care of. All I know is that when my hair is cut short, it's chaotic. What I remember is the humiliation of the high school yearbook picture with the parted hair poofed up on one side. On nature post-storm. It's been a week since the tropical storm hit the island and we are still waiting for the hard muscle of the ocean to stop spasming. The waves are a solid line of breakers. High tide is at our door. The pelicans are returning, but the sanderlings are still running back and forth in the yards as if they think they're racing in and out of the surf. The intracoastal waterway is a solid brown. There'll be no more clamming until the saline levels rise to kill off the bacteria. Mines at work. 
The bed at the beach had given me a neck headache. Now the humidity ran down the windows and the sheets and the carpeting were sticky wet. I threw open the bank of windows to let in the crazed wind, but the air in the room just swelled asthmatically. The sky over the ocean was a blotchy black and green, like bruises on fat. There was a message on my cell phone from Fran's daughter, Mimi. I called her back. She has a singer's voice. We talked in conspiratorial tones. Pop is frail. Fran is losing her mind. Mimi says, you think, okay, she's like a 12-year-old, but really now she's five. Oh, you'd never know. Yes, her social skills are beautiful. I hang up. I try to wrap my mind around this. Fran is five. So what, no more leaving them alone? I don't think so. Fran tells me that she buys her clothes from catalogs now, that she married a guy because they both love to dance, but he turned out to be way more work than the four kids combined and unfaithful to boot, that her daddy was a Presbyterian minister who made a different kind of ice cream every night, the neighborhood kids peering around the corners of the porch to see if it was ready yet. Every kind worked except the watermelon. Worlding three. Most worldings keep you company, but usually only a little bit. What we get is a lot of practice in bearing light returns, in peeking around corners and pricked ears. What is, whatever's happening loops through some reiterative re-upping of the details at hand. It takes a lot more than clarity to keep someone going. Certainty can be nothing more than an expressivity mistake or a thing too materialized in an out-of-body way, like the sight of a dog poop deposited on the living room floor when you get up in the morning headed for the coffee pot. You might find a speculative interest to get you going, or you might inherit some tick of a restart button. Most people seem to be in the middle of a lot of start, stopping and starting, as if we're, we're all stuck in something we somehow ended up in. Hoarding. One guy collects things to, to kickstart himself. He sees the collecting as a straight up stage in the creative process. The things gather themselves into companionable clumps. Fishing rods with reels and hooks and flies, jewelry making beads and silvers, leather working needles and oils, guitars with their strings and song lists, and capos and stands, hats kept upside down on the tops of the bookshelves, boots with their inserts, stretchers and polishes, knives with cases and sharpeners, fountain pens with their jars of ink and methods of cleaning, acrylic paints with rolls of canvas and paper, a dozen large glass pitchers full of brushes, books everywhere, their bookmarks, the reading lights that hook into their covers and hang on the bed frame, magnifying lenses with lights and book stands so your hands are free to do what the book is telling you to do. The man buries himself in routines of care and repair. Painting, music, and writing recede behind a wall. At best, now, he can curate. His thinking becomes catalogic. He reads catalogs, filing the details of springs and cabinet hardware in his brain. There's some peace in this, but it's prolific, too. He has favorite companies. He mail orders more things. He decides to build a racing bike, and every day more and bigger boxes start arriving. He needs a certain kind of screw he can't find. He picks at his cuticles. He's poised in a trap, like the quarters in the rip-off machine that seem poised to tumble out if you just put one more in the slot. Anything else that comes at him becomes an attack on his concentration. He has learned to become perfectly still. There is always someone to blame if things happen. But this gives way to, um, I'm sorry, he, he spends, every, everything sets off hours of searching for a missing piece, but this gives way to treasures discovered, scenes that once held promise and now hold the memory of a pulse. Worlding three. 
We dream, as Foucault once did, of an approach that, quote, would not be sovereign or dressed in red. It would bear the lightning of possible storms, unquote. Partial tangibilities initiate a wandering through little bits of social compost or historical debris, a joke, a hat worn a certain way. There is a constant gathering of what's dispersed, a fishing weir tossed out to capture what could be happening in some rote repetition, a mistaken impression, or a precise intuition. A return. I dream of going back. There's a river where the canyon used to be. A dozen people of all sizes and shapes are climbing up on each other's shoulders like cheerleaders in a triangle formation, but not. The guy in the middle holds a tow, ripe, tow rope behind a speedboat. They take off. A, he a heavy, older, blonde woman falls off the top of the triangle and does a perfect landing in only six inches of water. Some kind of brave and reckless flourishing. Then I'm visiting the place. The trees have grown up, obscuring the view of the canyon. There's no trash pickup, so every day I find a place to dump a bag. At the boardwalk, outside the supermarket where the cashiers take their cigarette breaks, at a rest area, a restaurant. I have to case out places, rush in and out, a victory, a guilty fear. The signs on every trash can and dumpster announce that violators will be prosecuted but no local would pay for trash. I'm bossier in my New England. Hey, where's the exit? What's going on with the restrooms? I'm talking again about bed bugs and cockroaches and the horror of a heat wave. I feel Peg's visceral objection to leaving the air conditioner on when there's a window open. I remember that toasters have to be unplugged when you leave the house. I see the outline of laughable topics that lead from the gut. On the island, Peg and George shove grocery bags into the back of their shorts to walk the dogs. George perks up when I tell him that Ron buys doggy bags. What? How much does he pay for them? George gets them to double bag his groceries so he'll have the bags. There's a law against plastic bags in Austin. Well, yeah, duh. It's only a matter of time here, too, but that's why I get them to double bag. George is serious, but he takes my laugh in stride. I wonder how long I can go on like this. It's fun to tweak a regional nerve, but I'm starting to want to branch out on my own. At the hotel, an egg cooking machine is driving me crazy. There's one dial for temperature and another for time. You lower your eggs into one of two baskets of steaming water. I keep opening still raw eggs and throwing them away with loud sound effects. Others are getting upset that their eggs are getting mixed up with other people's, so they don't know, so they don't know which is which. Finally, I notice that there's a huge sign with detailed operating instructions, but by now we're all, all we've all, all had enough of all this, poised between a fuck you shrug and an eye roll. There's been a brawl, a weekend of house parties. Some drunk Asian American women met two drunk young Irish American women in the street crying because their dogs were missing. The Irish accused the Asians of eating their dogs, though they later claimed in print that they had said beating the dogs. There was a fight, a broken leg, some ribs, assumptions of victims and villains, money raised for medical bills. Then they're all charged with assault and battery. Peg and George's take on it is that there's only one cop and he's a weak link. He's a bit of a character, a bit of a dress up cop. He probably had no idea what to do with all that when he arrived on the scene. The next day we take the mail boat at each dock, women and children wait to buy ice cream treats, and groups of teenagers climb high poles and dive into the lake to see us off. One island is designated a wilderness area, but it hasn't always been so. The previous owner built an airstrip down the middle. The woman sitting in front of me turns around to say, it must have been a movie star, and we exchange speculative glances and noises. She tells her husband he could move up a seat to get a better breeze. She grabs the plastic bag he drops so it doesn't fall into the lake. 
All summer there are surreal wedding scenes of bridesmaids in yellow and lavender floating down to the harbor along the brick sidewalk. A bride standing in her dress on a dock waiting. Groomsmen clumped in black formality. Suspensions in the mode of pause, poise, and pose. Households. I take a walk. At first, the houses are a little disheveled and bruised. The yards are piles of split wood, a carpet of pine needles under tall, dark trees, a fire pit, a shed, axes and chainsaws, coolers, pickups, campers, and boats. Inside, via Trulia, there's green carpeting and dull furniture, a bareness tipping into the almost hoarding of inadequate closets, an aesthetic aimed at filling in the empty spaces, overwhelms itself. Decorations manically thrown at a wall, baskets crammed together along the tops of the kitchen cabinets, a realism half realized and half succumbed to. Sometimes there are pi piles of plastic boxes in a corner of the living room or they've spread across a wall or are spilling out over the couch and onto the floor, littering the living with something not right, as if things can't stand up on their own anymore. Painfully steep stairs lead to tiny upstairs bedrooms painted hyper bright colors in paint so flat it makes my fingertips feel dry. Just dark furniture, or again the collapsed piles that started by the windows, and all of this amazingly blurry in self-made real estate photos, a smudging. Further down the street, I come to the houses on the water, made and tended with professional help. See-through houses with big windows and doors lined up to frame the blue lake and mountains, absolutely still beds of pine needles and daylilies. I follow the road as far as it goes, ending up to a, in a sandy dead end circle of the old original camp houses with rope swings hanging out over the lake, little windows on the second stories, all weather chairs in the yards and serious vegetable gardens. The women. The women in customer service keep asking me, 512, is that an area code? Where's that from? Texas, oh, I feel sorry for people who have to live in Texas. What is it there now? The tornadoes, the floods, oh my goodness, what's the temperature? I'll take the snow and cold any day. They're constitutionally liberal. They believe in quality of life and social services, but it's also like they've joined the local booster club. Everyone in the US now seems to think wherever they live is exactly right in the middle. Not too much, not too little, not too far, not too close, not too hot, not too cold. Like they're making a choice every day. The women, too. Mary says she has to get back to work, but she's really on a roll. She's getting a beer and sitting down. She's working for a criminal defense attorney. Some asshole beat the crap out of his girlfriend, she says, and she's come up with an argument that the 9-11 call is inadmissible because the statement, he choked me, is not an imminent threat, but a past threat. Mary thinks what she's doing is bad, but she's into it. I wonder what I'm doing here. Mary tells my sister I'm a trip, like it's charming to find another woman still alive in an oldish body or from somewhere. Worlding, one, two, three, four. The new ordinary is more a prism than a structure, more a collective search engine than a grammar. Its too muchness is deficient. It has zones of inflation, pop-outs, little areas of stabilization like a wave holding on the brink of breaking. But it's also an awkward accretion of bits and pieces you may or may not take to. Like a chalkboard covered with partially scratched out lines, its nimbus clouds of erasure form around the continuous recursivity of modifications and reciprocities. There are gestures, sequences, beginnings, missteps. Anxiety made a nest in her. This is Alfonso Lingus. A worlding is illuminated by movements of concern. A man screamed at her for having the dog off the leash. 
We made jokes about it. He's a crab face. Everyone else likes the dogs, but she's not taking any chances. Now she's afraid to cross the street, afraid to get out of the car at miniature golf, afraid to walk around the shoe store to see if her shoes fit because there might be a rule against it. She demands to see the rules before she'll stand up. Are they written down somewhere? She thinks we're rule breakers who will get her into trouble. She's on her own and disoriented. In Philly, we get caught in a violent thunderstorm and run through the rain and lightning. She's screaming. Back at the hotel, she cracks wide open, her mouth full of ice cream. She can't stop laughing. Plus, she got a 1,000 likes on some new site for a haiku she wrote about how life is worth something and we should take it seriously. <laughs> She's thrilled and wondering what this is. The twins, they shine. One's a ballet dancer. Music so ripples his shoulders and upper back that a little humpback appears. The other one's shine is more like drugs or a cluelessness he's become. When he was 11, he would leave the house in the middle of the night and go into the storm drains. One night he came back with chemical burns all over his forearms. They have both sustained a lot of damage. The dancer tells me about a woman he danced with at a restaurant. She's a doctor. Would someone like that be good for me to marry? Would it be good to try to get a job in a bar, maybe? Which one? Where's that? How much would it cost to get an apartment? How do you get electricity? Every few minutes, the twins move in for a hug, a touch. This summer, Ecological collapse, shag carpeted the earth in a thick mat of simulacra and romanticism. It wasn't the first time that melodramas of mixed ontological status hit swells. In Austin, the extreme El Nino replaced worst stage drought with two months of bad, bad rain. Wimberley's downtown disappeared. People on vacation in river cabins were washed downstream. A friend said, let's go to Blue Hole when you get back. Yeah, if it's still there. In North Carolina, sharks bite off, bit off teenagers' limbs, and then they were gone. One kid fought one off with, with hard punches, as he had heard he should do, but the shark just took his other arm. There were attacks on Cape Cod, too, something going on with the Atlantic. Migratory fear. In Austin, I had full-blown PTSD by the end of the school year. Loud noises in the house would make me jump. I couldn't bear anything. A friend described the same symptoms, so I knew it was a thing. But now, in the traffic-free North Woods, I'm afraid of hitting moose on the road just because there's a sign that says to watch out for them and something, some kind of reference to death. <laughs> in the lake, the light green water and sandy bottom give way to darkness. The waves pick up. The bite of the spawning pickerel can draw blood. My fear of the girl's anxiety makes me snap at her. Are you kidding me? Get a move on. Death moths. Meanwhile, back on the academic ranch, the death moths of humanist critique just keep snapping at the world as if the point of being and thought, being and thought is just to catch it in a lie as if some fixative of state science or normative fantasy could be the only problem. <laughs> and always the old puss-faced conviction that there's something wrong with people in general. Some of the things this misses, all of the extensions of ways of being touched, the tentacular lines of things on the move, the widespread joking, the voicing, the dark wakefulness, the sonorousness, the swelling variations of threat, how managing a life vies with a need for compensation or an unwitting ungluing, how things get started, how people try to bring things to an end, especially the day, through things that slide or slam or in marathon serial immersions, why thought as such might become an add-on or window dressing why conceptuality might take the form of a speed list, condensing incommensurate elements into something ungainly but recognizable, or why it matters that attention sometimes slows to a halt to wait for something to take shape. Evening falls in the village. 
Wednesday nights, the town orchestra plays in the bandstand. People sit in lawn chairs on the grass. The warm-up sounds like bad experimental jazz, but the program is all patriotic melody with a near parodic touch, like a New Yorker cover or a Maxfield Parish painting. Clumps of teenage boys swarm the fields at night in two styles of being. Responsible young men in the making in chinos and golf shirts, or bad boys with hips, their faces buried in hoodies and sunglasses. Across the green at the library, try it out bags include everything you need to get started, hiking, fly tying, candy making, being grandparents, reporting your own abuse, or energy saving. A flyer says you're not alone. Inside, there are calmly detailed descriptions of your options in various bad situations. What to do with the experiences you have, like the sight of the graffiti tags in Brazil, I believe, sorry, that just spelled poor gang, or being underwater following the midnight blue fish tattoos running down Rayo's calf and around his ankle as he points out the same little fish in the water with the stars on their backs. In downtown Laconia, I saw a woman standing on a sidewalk chain smoking and talking in an agitated way to a buff youngish man, trying to get him to give someone else a break because he means well or he didn't mean it or there are circumstances. Maybe her son, he didn't know no better. She's hanging in there, but someone's got some explaining to do. The whole top of her black hair is a helmet of white roots. The things that push up. What do you do with the restlessness, the announcement of a presence lodged piecemeal in something, the sensory paraphernalia blooming like algae, all the things that push matter, affect, and idea into an energetic state? There's the purposely quotidian ambition to register what's happening or the or the angling onto some pulse, some tempo, some reiterative experiment, or an incipient tendency you find yourself following, or a full-blown initiating impulse like the priest who asked me during my first confession at age seven if I had ever been impure. I said, I think so. <laughs> and he said, alone or with others? And the images began to pop vaguely into my head in a kind of method acting, splitting prolifically to follow leads. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Um, we have some time for some, some questions. Um, uh, and there is a, a mic at the side, both sides, actually. Thank you so much. That was astounding, Thank really you. astonishing and fantastic. Um, I just want to ask like a writing question. Uh, because, as I understand, were these the, the hundreds? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so I'm just curious about your decisions about sequencing them, uh, like that sort of s secondary level of composition. Like, how do you decide just the, I mean, the rhythm, you know, the flow of them? It, I, I could follow it. I stayed with it all the way through. But I'm curious from your side, like, how you decide yeah. on the, the overall that's a good question. Journey. Um, I start at the beginning every day. So it's really, it's sound for me. So I have these pieces and I start the composition for something that I'm writing. I have this many pages. And I, um, I start taking things out if I don't like really the sound or the rhythm of how they're coming along in the piece. Um, so there, a lot of them are written already as hundreds, and they're being pieced together, and I am just getting on a roll 
and starting to move through it. But it's actually a stupid and very time consuming way to do it. It takes me a long time. I keep moving things around and getting myself confused and then arrive at something. It's a wondering. Could I ask if that, if, if that process of always starting at the beginning has a relation to something like um, cumulative narrative structure in the, in the sense that I, you know, because one, one always has this feeling that you're, the, uh, there's this arraying of eventality, um, the, the minor events that come into a kind of cumulative force. <coughs> And, and hearing and feeling that, I have a sense also of a certain kind of um, narrative that arrives uh, in this listening to your piece around bad feeling. Hmm. And it's uh, yeah. because there, there are these instances of bad feeling that migrate. And then for me, listening this time, a sense of um, ecological catastrophe Mm. that somehow these bad feelings were migrating into that had a kind of narr a strong narrative force and was located towards the, mm. the kind of closure of the piece. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm always trying to get a little lighter there. Like, I don't like that ecological piece. And, and as I was thinking about it over the last couple of days, I started thinking in my, in my head that song, because that piece is called This Summer. And I've been thinking instead, and I almost sang it today. This summer I went swimming, this summer I almost drowned. But I went, picked my head, waved my arms around. So I don't want that sensibility to be, I want to bring it in, right? The accumulative, the other issue about accumulation is for me, there's a Okay, I think, okay, I've said something about this kind of area and I want to add, there is a kind of an adding on to things, particularly with the theory about what worlding is. And so you can see that in the numbering, worlding one, two, three, worlding one, two, three, four. Even though it's not really, here's one, two, and three, four points or anything like that. But it's a kind of a it's reiteration and a return. Um, so, it's not really um, a sequence, it's a constant um, shoveling back in. And then the tempo and the tone for me is this kind of wavy thing of, I want to say some things that are not very nice, um, but I also want to be funny. And, I, and my overall perspective is that that's the task if you're going to be going on with life. So I think things are not going well. Right, but uh, people are doing all kinds of weird and amazing, in good and bad ways, things in the process of things not going well. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you along these lines of composition about your lists. And so you've got the long list of the items in the freezer, and then you have, but those are items, all food items, and then you have the list of um, the, hoard, the, the hoarded, the, the hoarders things in the, in the living room. And then you said something about how things gather themselves into compatible groups. So just if you could say a bit more about the, your use of lists, or maybe you don't, like do you, is it an intuition that puts all these same it these items on one list, or do you go back and then recompose the list, edit ones out and put others no. in a different order? Well, those lists are actual. The hoarding list and the, the list of what's in the freezer are literal lists. I've just copied Pop's list of what's in his freezer on some day. Um, and so, so I become interested in lists and uh, with, in working with Lauren Berlant, who's a famous lister, um, because we're in uh, trying to think about the many varied possibilities in a something, in a scene or an object, something that's not quite unfolded, and we don't want to um, create a kind of positivism around what something is, right? So 
So the listing is a kind of an expansion out of all of the various forms that something can take, forms that happiness can take, or forms that hoarding can take. Then when, so then I become, so I'm interested in lists because of that theoretical question, right? How to open up how we can think about something and, and how we can use concepts to open things up in that way instead of closing them down. So then I become interested ethnographically in these found objects and characters and what they're doing with lists. So Pop, you know, I could go on and say things about him. He's got a military background and then he's, he's going on in this way. So I try to perform that by just reciting his list, which is an amazing list. And it, I'm trying to just incite curiosity in the reader for what could this character be up to that he would do this. And then the hoarding person, that guy, these are literally the kinds of things that he collects. I did say that they seem to be in companionable clusters, that when he's got the boot collection, he also has to have all the inserts and the stretchers and the polishes, that there's a kind of a kind of a completion of the collection that's always going on and standing in the way of his creative process, even though he sees this as the first step in any creative process. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you. This is incredible. I'm here. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a question about method acting. And I'm thinking about that, um, what it is in relationship to the United States, and particularly when you came up with the 1950s and 1960s and JFK and all that. And I was thinking about like an actor, I don't know anything about method acting, so I'll be here with my fellow friends, actors, that maybe help me, me a little bit. But as far as I understand, as an actor, you throw yourself into a situation that is, kind of, is surreal, doesn't belong to your life. And then you pick up fragments or memories of your life, and then you deal with it, right? So I'm thinking about like what is the relationship between a memory that is yours and a situation that seem that you seem not to belong to somehow. And there's something about that you insist in bringing back this kind of foreignness of Texas. Like you, there's a kind of displacement. Yeah. Everyone seems to be displaced in the place that is supposed to be theirs. So I'm just wondering about if this is yeah. a way of navigating being in the right. United States. Right, oh, well, yeah, maybe so. Um, I mean, you know, the place thing is a whole other question uh, for me, but, and that there are pieces of, of other kinds of writing that I'm doing about place that have to do with New England and Texas for me, but also outside of me. They're very different constitutions of place. So I think there are regional differences and other kinds of differences, and for every person, they're all different in how things like that get constituted. And I don't know anything about character acting. As I said, it just came to me as this bloom of images. But I think that I've been, because I've been doing a lot of writing about New England, which, uh, which is a lot in here, and then this summer I was in this place that was kind of familiar but foreign in New Hampshire. And I started thinking about, so the character acting thing for me there is, uh, or that's the image that I can think of with it, is that people are really uh, working with points, what I call points of precision. And that's important to me to think about how analysis or living occur through these very precise points and therefore the importance of forms that throw together uh, in so-called cultures or whatever the situation is that you're in. So the guys in the Eloquoia store, store having the perfect timing, they are on, they are enacting themselves as character actors of that place. And then I mention, yeah, but they, you know, they're from Massachusetts, from these things that have, that are parodic places, Slummerville and Lynn Lynn, the city of sin. And they came up here accidentally, and they're estranged because of their right-wing Gestapo police problems, right? So the so the subject so so the question of character acting, as you're asking it, and as I think of it too, is is also a larger question of what is a subject in a in a scene, a situation, a world, a culture, whatever it is 
that it's in the something, and that's 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 what's interesting to me is what's that something, and how does how does that something become a thing that enters a character in a particular way? All these weird little localisms, like George's thing about trash bags, you know that that for me is that he's fashioning himself as a character through that very precise detail, and is. And it's so it's an elaboration. There's a lot of joking about it. And he'll go after Ron about buying the little poop bags for the dogs. And it's an opportunity, right, to um, fool around with what an identity is, even though it's also a kind of way of performing a being. Yes, following on the, thank you for your beautiful, very rich talk, following on the prompt on method acting, one of the things that came up for me was uh, in your talk to think of uh, ethnography as kind of a method acting, because the kind of promise of method acting is private behavior in public. And I think ethnography, too, is a kind of uh, private knowing made public, in a that's way. Good. So that's something that, um, that the prompt of method acting made me you know, think of as you were weaving through the work, yeah. That's really interesting, and anthropologists always like to tell stories about how they were children when they first went into the field and they didn't know how to do, and then they'll specify X, Y, and Z in their private worlds in this public world, and then they think, then they say, then they learned how to do the X as if that made them something else. And so, yeah, I think that's a really interesting comment. And I think that's interesting to think about what happens to the academics who come back because people often have really great experiences when they're doing their field work. And then they come back and think that they, and then they get slammed with the apparatus. So all this stuff that they write down in their field notes is amazing. And then they can't figure out how to put it into a dissertation, so they take it all out. It's amazing. So all my work is about don't do that. Keep the field notes, work from the ethnography, which is really like work from the character that you were for that year when you were actually learning something. That's interesting. Yeah. Following up on that question, um, can you talk about the self that emerges for you as you write, the kind of um, subject, or if there's another word for um, the kind of um, autopoiesis or uh, emergent subject that you become, and, and particularly in relationship to the, the figure of memory, um, as you described it as debris, um, would you call the kind of hundred words memories or in debris or something yeah. altogether different? Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's different with every writing project. And the project that I did before this book was, the there's a book on, on worlding, which is what a lot of this is going into too. <laughs> Um, I actually had invented a character called She, who was me, because I it just it had to do that in the way that that book was written. I needed to have a kind of a fictional character distance, even though there wasn't anything fictional about the She, right? But I, I thought I, ne I needed to have some kind of formal mechanism uh, to create some kind of a triangle to write that thing. And this one is um, the, the Hundreds book is wonderful because it's so short, the pieces are so short, and then because we're writing the book together, we're going to be interrupting each other. So each, the problem of that is really just in each one, which can mean anything. I mean, I can, I think that's what's happening to me is that I kind of have different personae in some of the different hundreds, such as the voice Adrian was talking about of the dark and the light and the, the funny and um, and maybe we'll have to try to figure something out about that. But I think we've structured it in such a way that we'll be able to have a lot of difference in ourselves in that structure. I hope so. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, this is not a question, it's a, just a comment. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, it was really interesting for me to listen to you because I teach your ordinary affects in uh, every single one of my intro to filmmaking classes.
classes. Mm -hmm. And I, it was starting to let me think a little bit about the kind of instructions of how to pay attention. And so some of that of the kind of acting and method for me, not as connected in terms of sort of the history of performance, but more as how to act and a kind of method for it for how to act oh, as that's a filmmaker. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you for right. that. And my students love it, so. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks so much. Um, it, it keeps, for some reason, I can't stop pulling back to this, the, Car, the Carl O, what's his last name? Nauxen books, My Struggle. Have, have you read those books? Because it's so, no, it's I know. just like 3,500 page, like very personal narrative, but it's it's a fiction, but it's clearly a nonfiction, but there's something interesting, like what you're doing with the small, the short hundred, the hundreds and the worlding and this kind of hovering a little outside of what you're seeing that you're kind of, you can sort of stand outside of that. You can sort of place yourself in that picture. And then in response to this other book where it's so, the details are so finite and it's so inside of this person's psychology at all these times, mm. it just goes on and on. But they somehow have this, like I, the whole time I couldn't help but struggle with the relation between them, even though they seem so like opposed or in conflict, but they're doing something so similar. Oh, I have to read that. Long read. <laughs> Thank you. Following on that, Katie, I'm always struck by, I want to ask a question about methodology, not just method, but when you are making, when your life is your ethnography, what is your method? then you really, your life is as a method actor, and I suppose that's your point. But of course, having lived in, some, in Austin as well, I recognize a lot of the places in, in your work, and I'm wondering about your methodology when life becomes ethnography, and if you have any I don't even, I don't understand that question. Anthropologists always ask me that question. <laughs> I don't understand it, literally. I, I, I hear what you're saying and think it's, it's well articulated, but I don't know why you have to have a methodology that's not your life or something. And it's not really my life, as you know. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a sort of a, an, obs, uh, an obsessive practice of noticing things, um, which, has, which I've become it's sort of become comfortable with over time. It's not really hypervigilance anymore. It's because of the constant working in the writing where there's a kind there's kinds of forms of pleasure and um, cert, I, I hope certain kinds of openness or at least non-judgmentalism um, or curiosity. Let's just say curiosity, right? So anthropologists say things to me like, um, I really liked it when you were doing ethnography, now you're just talking about yourself. But I learned a lot about America that I never knew before. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you've lived here your entire life. So, so it's like the question, what's the methodology, is a, that's an anthropology question, but right? Question it's a was, discipline question. Yeah, yeah. I right. wasn't meaning to say what's the methodology. Perhaps I did say that, but what I think uh, one of one of the things your work does is collapse method acting Absolutely. and methodology. Yes. And in, the, in, in light of Knosgaard, for example, it also, and I know this is, uh, you're aware of, of doing this, collapses fiction and, right. and ethnography. Right. So I think, you know, yeah. So, okay, so the methodology is that, to do whatever it takes it's like, I really like Isabella Stenger's, Deborah and I were talking about her earlier today, and she has this notion of a vivid pragmatics. Maybe that's my methodology, right? Do whatever it takes to figure out how to get across something of what's going on. 
<laughs> right? Because we just need so much more description of that from so many different character actors, right? Thank you so much. That's such a perfect note to end the whole of today on. Thank, Thank you. So you. Please come back tomorrow afternoon uh, at the French Institute uh, for another session. Thank you so much.